reporting. Um, I'm glad to have uh, Dr. Fanon Napazir here today um, to talk about why so many religions. Um, Dr. Fanon Napazir was born in Iran and spent his childhood and youth in Africa. Uh, he's a graduate of Edinburgh Medical School and was selected as a fellow of Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Uh, he trained in cardiology and specialized in electrophysiology at Duke Medical Center, following which he was recruited to study causes of sudden death in athletes and patients with familial cardio diseases at the National Institute of Health. He became a chief of the section of inherited heart disease at the National Institute of Health. He spent two and a half years in Haifa, Israel, where he was the director of health services at the Baha'i World Center and the visiting professor of molecular genetics at Technion Israel Institute of Technology. Uh, Dr. Farhan Apazi recently authored the book entitled Islam at the Crossroads. Uh, in the book, he examines the issues that Islam increasingly faces and their potential solutions. Um, Dr. Farhan Apazir is a member of the Baha'i community. Uh, he is motivated by the tenet of his faith to promote unity and understanding of all faiths and to promote the oneness of uh, the human family. Uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Farhan Apazir. Hello, Pond. Thank you. Good morning, friends. This is a good morning from Huntsville, Alabama. And I miss you guys, and hopefully we'll see each other one of these days again. This is a very important question. Why are there so many religions and so many denominations? I have the next one for you. One reality, you know, that's prevalent is that the world indeed has multiple religions with irreconcilable teachings, traditions, and rituals. And that is okay, people say, because it leads to diversity, and diversity is a wonderful thing. However, it's not as benign as one thinks. Next slide, please. This is a map of the world which shows the various religions with green, mostly in Northern Africa and the Middle East, Islam, and then the rest of the world, largely Christianity with Buddhism um, in China. And therefore, you know, the almighty God had to reveal his religion to different sections of humanity separated by these vast distances. But today, Baha'u'llah is addressing all humans. So there is less reason for uh, uh, so many different religious experiences. Next slide, please. And then, Unfortunately, these religions of the divides are further aggravated by sectarianism. These are the different factions of Islam, of uh, Sunni Islam and Shia Islam, um, largely based on what interpretation of the Sharia law jurisprudence uh, they are practicing. So, this is Islam divided up. Next slide, please. Now, it was never supposed to be this, particularly in Christianity, we find that Christ states, if a house is divided against itself, it cannot survive, it cannot stand. And then he gives them a new commandment. He says that you love one another, just as I have loved you you also are to love one another. This is how people will know 
that you are Christians. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And then one of the apostles states, we know that we have passed from spiritual death into life. You know, forget about the, uh, waiting for resurrection. He says, we have already passed out of death into life. Why? Because we love the brothers. That includes the sisters. Whoever does not love abides in death. So the definition of death is lack of that love. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Next slide, please. So this is Christianity divided up. The red is mostly Southern Baptist. The blue, the Catholic Church. The gray, the... the the Mormons, and then a sprinkling of others. So it's regionally as well divided. Next slide, please. You know, the, in the first number of centuries, there were only two sects of Christianity. Then it became three. Then by 1800, it became 500. Today, there are more than 40,000 denominations of Christianity. A faith which Christ said, a house divided against itself cannot survive. And it's estimated, if the curve continues, by, that by the 2100, there will be 260 denominations of Christianity. Next slide, please. Well done. So this is not very benign um, as well. You know, the religion and the denominations, in the name of religions, there are currently many wars being waged around the world. If you look at the brown golden um, um, line, you will see that the non-religious conflicts have actually fallen in the past 30 years. But uh, the blue, in terms of religious conflict, it's gone from less than five in 1975 to now more than 35. So that's rising. Religious warfare, conflicts are increasing while non-religious ones are falling. Next slide, please. So that's the reality. That's one reality. Irreconcilable religions and denominations. There is another reality put forward by, by faith. And that is, these religions all speak about one creator. This one creator is Rabbul Alamin in the Quran, first chapter, Rabbul Alamin. He's the Lord of all humanity. So he has one purpose. So although there are multiple religions, there is, an, in a sense, one common faith. The faith is one. And today, the Baha'i faith has not come to bring another religion, but to renew that faith according to the advent of divine justice and the world order of Baha'u'llah. And today, that faith, that eternal faith, eternal in the past, eternal in the future, which speaks with the same voice, that faith is addressing all humanity as one entity on, on the planet Earth. Next slide, please. So this has become a law of Baha'u'llah. We read, he writes, through him the light of unity has shone forth. 
and the law of oneness has been revealed amidst the nations. Well, it's a uh, quaint to have uh, this diversity, but God has prescribed the law of oneness for the greatest efficiency, for the greatest good of humanity, there has to be a oneness. A oneness, a realization of the oneness of the creator, the oneness of his purpose, and that purpose is now addressing one humanity. Next slide. So what's the obstacle to this? This sounds so reasonable. What's the obstacle? One of the greatest obstacle, as recognized by Baha'u'llah himself, is the concept that the institutions of those religions promote, that is the exclusivity, superiority, and finality of their particular religion, of their particular denomination. For example, next slide, please. The first quotation that one encounters uh, when speaking to a seeker may be this one from John 14, 6. And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, if he's the way, then why do we need Baha'u'llah? Why does, does a seeker have to investigate? Why is there any need for new prescriptions? But you know, I was thinking the other day, how can one illustrate this issue? Once a month or once every two months, my wife Karen and I used to make the trip to Cincinnati to see, to see my daughter-in-law, Katrina, and her husband, Nafe and their children, Jome, Tole, and Tahir. So we would set out from Cumberland, and the way at the beginning was called the I-68. Then it became the I-70. Then the I-71, and finally a road to 75. Now the I-68 could very well say, I am the way. The only way you get to Cincinnati is to go through me. But then the I-70 uh, could say exactly the same thing. But they all lead to a destination. There is no sense of superiority or inferiority. They have all come, these religions, to guide us to where God wills us to be. Next slide, please. So Baha'u'llah in one of his earlier writings says these countenances, meaning the countenance of God, these, uh, these manifestations of God, these prophets, messengers, whatever you like to call them, these countenances, are the recipients of divine command. God tells them what to reveal. That they are the day springs of his revelation. They bring his revelation. Now the day lights up from different parts of horizon, different times of the year, different countries, but the sun will remain the sun. To say that uh, that our, our day spring is, the, is superior, doesn't make sense. And Baha'u'llah says this revelation is exalted, not only his revelation, but all revelation. This revelation is exalted above the veils of plurality and the exigencies of number. Once you start multiplying the one faith of God, then you are, in the words of the of Islam, shirk. You are multiplying 
God and his command. That plurality becomes a veil. So faith is not nine or eight or seven or 10 or 12 different names, but it's one. Next slide, please. And this concept of the law of oneness is illustrated in so many ways by Baha'u'llah and in the Baha'i writings. Here, Baha'u'llah states these principles and laws of these firmly established and mighty systems, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the faith of the Baal, Baha'u'llah, have proceeded from one source and are rays of one light. Now, the only reason why they differ from one another is to be attributed to the different requirements of the age in which they appeared. Next slide, please. Light is light. Baha'u'llah again says, they differ only, these religions differ only in the intensity of the light. Some have more photons than others, but light still remains light. And just because one appears like a candle, the other one like a lamp, the other one like a, the midsummer sun is not because of a failure lack of capacity of the teacher, of the person bringing the light. Why would God send a messenger, send somebody, a mediator in the words of the Bible, but a defective one, the one that can't bring the full measure of God's purpose? and says, and this not by reason of any inherent incapacity of any of them to reveal in a fuller measure the glory of the message with which he has been entrusted, but rather because of the immaturity and unpreparedness of the age he lived in to understand, to absorb the full potentials, potentialities latent in that faith. This is exactly out of the Gospel of John 16. It says, I have yet many things to tell you, but you, you cannot bear it now. Moses could have brought everything that Christ brought. Christ could have, uh, could have brought everything that Baha'u'llah has brought. And Christ says, I have come so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. The greater abundance of life is not a superiority, it's just that humanity is now capable of receiving a greater measure of God's grace. Next slide, please. So Revelation is also in scripture, particularly in the Bible, referred to as water. Water is essential for life. But that water can come in different quantities. In Genesis, it's described as a dewdrop. It can come as a glass. It can come as a rain. It can be a brook, a river, a mighty ocean. But again, there's no superiority inferior. It is still water. Next slide. So this principle of oneness of God, when you think about it, when there is one God and one faith, and today Baha'u'llah says the whole world is but one country and mankind are the citizens of that country, that mankind must also be one. So this principle of the oneness of mankind incorporates the oneness of God and the oneness of faith. It's the pivot that center point, the pivot around which 
all the teachings of Baha'u'llah revolve. All the teachings of Baha'u'llah revolve in, on that oneness, unity, which then, out of which comes justice and mercy. Next slide. So there are issues in that, you know, people have got used to the outer form of their religion, the tree itself, its leaves. But Christ says, what you have to concentrate on is the fruits. Because every good tree brings forth good fruit, he said. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. So then, by their fruit, you, sh you will recognize them. So if the tree of revelation, of teachings, brings unity, brings love, brings that oneness, it is divine. Next slide. The Quran says the same thing, that God's word is like a good tree. Its roots are firmly fixed. It goes to the waterbed and its branches spread out to the skies. It brings forth its fruit at all times. There are different times when that tree bears fruit. Next slide, please. And here Baha'u'llah, you see, they all speak the same language. Baha'u'llah says, the utterance of God is a lamp whose light is these words, that light of revelation. You are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Deal ye one with another with the utmost love and harmony, with friendliness and fellowship. So powerful is the light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. We have a function too. Baha'u'llah says, exert yourself that you may attain this transcendent and most sublime station, the station that can ensure the protection and security of all mankind. Peace and security depends on that oneness. This goal excelled every other goal, and this aspiration, this hope, is the king of all aspiration. Next slide, please. The Universal House of Justice, in their introduction to the Kitab Abbas, write, its peoples of whatever race, nation, or religions are being challenged to subordinate all lesser loyalties and limiting identities to their oneness as citizens of a single planetary homeland. You know, in a, living in a country where the supremacy, the primacy of this country is constantly being emphasized, and sometimes for good reason, but here, Baha'u'llah wishes us to, to subdue all these lesser loyalties, the national loyalties, the tribal loyalties, the family loyalties, to the loyalty to humanity, to global earth. The well-being of mankind, they quote Baha'u'llah, the, the well-being of mankind, its peace and security are unattainable unless and until its unity is firmly established. Next slide, please. And this has been a hope. This has been a hope for the past three or four thousand years of recorded scripture. The greatest prophet of the Hebrew Bible, Isaiah says, and the Gentiles, not the Jews only, and the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness, thy truth. The Gentiles are all the foreigners, are all the non-Jews, and all kings. 
all nationalities. And you shall be called by a new name, a common name, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And Christ, the next one, a thousand years later almost, he says, I have sheep of other sheep. You're not the only ones. They're not of this fold, the fold being Christianity. Them also I must bring, I must bring them too. And they shall hear my voice, which is the voice of God. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And in the Quran, it reminds us that the day will come when God will gather them together. Next slide, please. If the, the Quran and the Bible both state it will be not just lamb-like nationalities that will come together, but it will be wild and domestic animals will live together peacefully. Clearly, this is allegorical. The Quran says, and when the wild beasts shall be gathered together. Next slide, please. And there is, there is a really um, disgust almost uh, for any form of division and hold fast all together by the rope which God, the rope is Hablullah, is the covenant of God. If you hold fast to what God has covenanted with humanity at a particular dispensation and with the next dispensation, they hold on to what God wants them to do. They are then kept safe. And be not divided amongst yourself. So here we have Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, Jafari. As for those who divide their religion, in other words, create division in God's one faith and break it into parties, Shia, from which Shia comes from, the word Shia, in fact, one of the names of the sex have nothing to do with them. Thou has no part in them in the least. Leave them to God. Next slide, please. So another one, briefly, is that these divisions continue to exist because humanity persists in imitating. The faith becomes becomes a matter of inheritance rather than seeking and investigating. In the Quran it says, don't ask what these people believe. They only believe what their forefathers believed. They've just inherited it. But faith, dear friends, is too important to be a matter of inheritance. No Baha'i, no nobody should accept their faith without investigation. Next line, please. So they follow each other like sheep. I'm not sure whether the last one is telling the one in front, friend, where are we going with this? Next slide, please. And they, again, in the words of Christ, they adhere to the outer form of religion when that outer form clearly has become old. And it says no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch with the old. You start patching things, uh, coming up with your own ideas to resuscitate, rejuvenate your religion, liberalize it. You're going to make the rent worse. And then he says, no one pours a new wine into old goat skins. It's not good for the goat skins. It will make them burst. Next slide, please. 
Abdulba states, if the nations of the world forsake imitation and investigate, investigate the reality underlying the revealed word of God, they will agree and become reconciled because faith is reasonable for reality is one and not multiple. Next slide, please. So this is a commandment. This is not an uh, 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 optional. Christ says, ask, seek, and knock, and it shall be open to you. Everyone that asketh will receive. He that seeketh will find. And to him that knocketh, the door shall be open. But it's contingent. God opening his gates to you is contingent with you knocking at his door. Next slide, please. And the same exists in the Quran, and this is quoted by Baha'u'llah several times. And those who make this jah from where jihad comes from. If you make this jah, this striving to, to achieve what God's, to understand what God's purpose is, we will certainly guide you in our paths. There isn't one single path, it's not sabil, it's sobor. For verily God is for those who do right. Thank you, friends. This is just a uh, as briefly as I could make it, but if you have any questions, I will be happy to answer. Thank you. Everybody's gone so quiet. I don't see any hands up. I wonder if people are able to, they know how to raise their hand. If not, uh, Chinichi, do they have the ability to unmute themselves if they yes. have a question? Yes. Okay. So friends, anybody who has a question, please unmute yourself and ask the question if you're not able to raise your hand in the Zoom application. I have a question, Mahim. Go ahead, please. Farmer. I can hear you. Um, this may not be exactly on the subject, but I have a question. How does spirituality um, help us in this day and age? By that I mean now the disease and complications of this disease, uh, COVID-19, as far as, you know, all the difficulties as far as diseases that are happening and mortalities and um, financial difficulties people have, unemployment and everything. Um, how do we as Baha'is and overall the, all the people of faith um, can get some help from their belief in God and belief in messengers of God just to relieve ourselves from um, daily problems that are facing all of us, one way or the other? Or in other words, how do we go about that? Readings, I know, prayers, I know, but if, how, or if it's reading and prayers, how do we, <clears throat> I mean, every time you concentrate on the um, uh, spirituality, something else happens and you're kind of shaken in uh, by the difficulties that are happening to the humanity to each of us in a, in a different way thank you no baha'u'llah's prescriptions for humanity and the one we discussed today the law of oneness speaks directly to this it's a very pragmatic approach look at what's happening to the world the science of it is pretty clear briefly the science of it is very clear so what is the complicating factor that's caused such a great disaster? 
is excessive nationalism. It's in, in, the right, in our writings referred to as insane nationalism. It's not sanity. It's insanity. China blaming the United States, United States blaming this country. You've got South Korea, you have United Kingdom. They are not working as a global society confronting a virus that doesn't understand borders. So beyond prayers and beyond everything else, um, the concept of a oneness of humanity with all these other, in the words of the House of Justice, these lesser loyalties remaining lesser. And as Baha'is, we have to live that life. And, and uh, so we th are very inefficient. Our response to this threat, to these threats is very, very confused and minimal. It is like with everything else, all the other disasters, they all arise out of the lack of understanding that you guys are really the subjects of one Lord, he has one prescription, you're all one, you're inhabiting one planet Earth, one global Earth, and that is, should be our vision. The whole world is one country. So if you can just for a few minutes think about how that thinking can transform our reaction to this, to this uh, virus, alone or to hunger to lack of education to lack of water to the death and destruction in syria middle east africa you know then you realize we are far from heeding the prescription of baha'u'llah thank you for your question I see the great Dr. Yazdani. It's a lovely seeing you. One good thing the virus has done is brought us all together. <laughs> it's not. We will defeat it, but it will be painful. Not listening to Baha'u'llah's prescriptions is going to be painful for humanity. That's why in the Quran it says, Fi maradon, in the heart is a disease, is a disease. What is the disease? Is that that lack of unity, that lack of justice. And he says, and God will increase that disease because they have not listened. If you don't take the prescription, if you take all medicines, I mean, nationalism is really, ex we, we call it excessive nationalism, but it really makes no sense. I was born in Zabul Zahedan. Anybody knows Zabul Zahedan? It's near the Pakistan, Afghanistan border. And uh, we were there for a, sh a short period of time, but forever on my passport, he's a Zoboli, Zobol Zahida. <laughs> Just for the week that we were there, and my mother gave birth to me. All right, friends, any, any comments? Yes, General Yazda. You have to unmute yourself. Yes. Yes, I okay. Befam. Oh, you're muted again. Yeah. Yes. I just want to say Allah to Mr. Pranan Fazir. He's been Thank right you. dear friend for a long time, many years. And uh, I congratulate him to um, serving Baha'i faith so well. 
and uh, we are pleased to hear uh, him talking all the time. So I say Allah power to him. Thank him you. And all the friends who are listening. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question, Dr. Farhan Apaji from Emmanuel. Emmanuel, go ahead, please. What a nice name, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. We please. can't hear you, Emmanuel. You, to, you are muted, but we can't hear you. You have to put the sound up, the volume. I think his the microphone may be up. Emmanuel, we still cannot hear you. Maybe while he's sorting it out, somebody else can ask a question. Yeah. Befama. Baramak. You have to unmute yourself. Go ahead. Go ahead. Now Go ahead. I can. Now I can. Thank you. Um, Christ talks about the good tree and the bad tree. And Laurent talks about the good tree and the bad tree. I haven't seen anywhere Baha'u'llah talking about a good tree and a bad tree. In fact, Baha'u'llah just says, you're all the leaves of one tree, of one branch and the fruits of one tree. Does Baha'u'llah ever talk about a good tree and a bad tree? No, to bring about unity, it's a very good question. To bring about unity, his emphasis is on transformation. Transformation is the theme of Jawaharul Asrol, the gems of divine mystery. You know, the, the question the cleric asked was, with all these expectations we have of the Mahdi and the Qa'im, how did, how did that Mahdi and Qa'im become the Bab? <laughs> On the surface, this is not what we expected. So, you know, then the whole Jawaharlal Asra talks about the transformation largely in terms of thinking and concepts and realities. That if, you, if you're in the old reality, the above presentation can be a problem, but it's not a presentation. So in order for Baha'u'llah to create unity, to create love, he cannot talk about the we, he does talk about satanic fancy, idle imaginations, largely the thinking of religious leaders which create disunity. Those are satanic, but this, there is no reality to it. So he talks about, you know, the trees one, its leaves are one, its branches are one, and the fruit today is good. So he is emphasizing unity. So they all use that analogy, but they have different approaches to it. The approach to Christ speaking the same, almost the same language. You remember in the in the um, Kitab Iran says they they sit on the same throne, utter the same speech, proclaim the same faith soar in the same heaven, but the thing is, they proclaim the same faith, they utter the same speech, but they adapt it to the people of their time. So Christ emphasizes uh, that the results of a good tree is good. That's how you judge the next dispensation. That's how you judge his revelation by the fruits. In Islam, it talks about the, the tree that is tayyab, which is pure, which is good, in that that tree, it says, produces its fruits at, in different uh, dispensation at different times, but they all draw water from the same water bed. They are, they are part of the same source. Baha'u'llah talks about the more about the oneness. This tree, its fruits are good and its leaves are one. I don't know whether that answers your question. Thank you. It was a good question. Next, anybody else? 
Emmanuel, do you want to try again before we go to the next person? I still don't hear. Um, Lynn, go ahead, please. You have to talk. I did. Oh, okay. All right. Um, you talked wonderfully about the oneness of mankind. And you also spoke about the transformation of concepts and ideals. And I know personally, I'm, I'm bound down by old concepts of what the oneness of mankind means. What is the pathway to changing our understanding of the oneness of mankind? We have to start with ourselves to begin with. Uh, you know, as um, we have to get any rid of any concepts that now, you know, the past is past, and now we have to concentrate on our revelation and that we have the superior one. Why rely on the past? So, the, you know, we have to get rid of those prejudices. We have to read the writings. In the writings in the Iran, the first paragraph, it says, Consider the past. What, what you're experiencing today, Baha'u'llah says, states, is what has been experienced at the dawn of every, every revelation, every dispensation. If you just know, if a Christian knows the difficulties, revisits the difficulties that Christ faced when the Jewish leaders objected to him or that Muhammad faced, when the Jews and Christians in Medina objected to him, if you could understand the difficulties they had, then you would have no problem today considering that oneness. So the, the concept of oneness is the return of the, of the good things, but in a greater volume, but also the return of the bad things. We have to change our outlook. We have to you know, one of the things that uh, the Guardian quotes um, and says it, it, it's with the authority of Abdobo is that women, one of the miracles, you know, we don't believe in too much in miracles, but what, uh, the, the miracle he quotes is that women in this faith have always been bolder, more bold than the men. Sorry, men. You know, so, uh, and he's, he hopes that the women will continue this boldness. You know, that they won't give up to this boldness. They will, so that's a miracle of this faith. When, when you really think about it, in the gospel it says, or in the New Testament, I suffer a woman not to speak, and women have been suppressed, but in this, in this revelation, women have been bolder, and they have Martha Root, you know, is a prime example of boldness. And so we have to be a bit more bold. We have to take more initiative, and uh, and uh, we should encourage each other. There should be no discouragement. It should be, we should encourage each other, whether it is as an individuals or as a community or as our institutions, we have to work and bring Baha'u'llah's prescription. And we have to remember that that prescription in the Kitab Ahdas is directed at the individual. It says, we have prescribed teaching and to everyone, every individual. And that, and those individuals, um, it's not the doctor that benefits from that prescription. Baha'u'llah doesn't feel much better. No, it is that person which takes Baha'u'llah's message and says, I believe in Baha'u'llah because of this, because of this. I bear witness, I testify. 
then their faith increases. So there are many, many things we have to do. And, uh, and uh, our history is a, is a good place to begin with. We should read that history again. Thank you for that question, Lynn. Shahriar, did you have your hand up? Okay, don't touch the button. Let me unmute you. Okay, go ahead. I didn't, but now that you called on me, I'll ask a question from Dr. Lame. Dr. Lame, <laughs> I joined in late, but I wanted to know what your perspective was on the corona pandemic and how the Baha'is should respond to it. Thank you. Uh, that's a very big question. But um, um, there is a fireside at Jan Sadevians at the end of the month that I will be addressing this issue. What's the science of it and what's the faith aspects of it? That's, uh, but really, simply, we should become even more united. We should be even more concerned with each other's welfare. We should act as one family. And, uh, and uh, do what Baha'u'llah has asked us to do. This virus will pass away other problems will face humanity. And uh, you know, we were very lucky with this one. I mean, if it had the potential of SARS for killing, together with its own virulency, we'll be in deep trouble. Or the, the one in 1914, and just be, before the Second World or uh, First World War, we should really we are very lucky, and, but there will be others. I mean, and so humanity needs to get its act together. Okay. Emmanuel, I unmuted you. Can you try one more time? Can you hear me? Oh, yes, it's, it's okay. Go ahead, please, with your question. Well, actually, I didn't have a question, but uh, I really enjoyed what uh, Marine was uh, saying. And maybe I have uh, an answer for her uh, from some scriptures that uh, uh, written by Abdul Baha. Uh, it says, uh, tests are a means by which a soul is measured as to its fitness and proven out by its own acts. God knows its fitness beforehand, and also his unpreparedness. But man with an ego would not believe himself unfit unless proof were given him. Consequently, his susceptibility to evil is proven to him when he falls into the tests. And the tests are continued until the soul realizes its own unfitness. Then, sin, then remorse and regret tend to root out the weakness. The same test comes again in greater degree until it's shown that the former weakness has become a strength and the power to overcome evil has been established. That's from Abdul Baha. Thank you. That's very wonderful. It reminds me of this. Uh, of this prayer of Baha'u'llah, but for the tribulations that are sustained in thy path, how could thy two lovers be recognized? And then there are passages where it states that the humanity will always experience suffering. Um, you cannot escape suffering. But what a great thing it is that suffering if it is in the path of God, if it's in the path of teaching. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other hands. And, oh, there's, uh, go ahead, please, Mrs. Yazdan, Dr. Yazdan. Oh, I unmuted you, so. No. I can't, can't hear you. Would you please maybe unmute yourself? I'll, I'll... 
Okay. Um, what this? Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted a comment that I wanted to uh, uh, tell all the say all to all the mothers uh, the, in this mm -hmm. that I see on this screen. Happy Mother's Day. Um, and um, one of the things that um, I have found, as you know, there's a prediction and it's already happened and it's going to get worse. Um, the degree of depression and suicides that due to this isolation, this fear of the disease and isolation is going to skyrocket in, in the future. It's already started. Um, and we as Baha'is are supposed to be uh, the, the healer, I think. And um, so rather than sitting down and worrying about our own things, which, you know, of course you can't help it, but according to the, I think it was Abdul Baha who said, when you're in difficulty, just get up and go and help somebody who is suffering more than you do. So um, I think we should do that, just to save our own self and to help others, starting from our own community, um, and um, just think about the mothers today, especially, who are not close to their children or for one reason or other, they are institutionalized in the nursing homes and, or they are sick or, you know, just at least give them a call. Um, what I did yesterday is that I um, took some small amount of grocery uh, to some families in our community. And of course, because of social distancing, I uh, left it behind their door, but I called them up on the phone and I told them. And I, it left me with, with a pleasure that I did something for, for Mother's Day. And um, I am intending to, to do that more often. And of course, I know you guys are doing that too, or you will do it. But I find it very soothing and very helpful and to bring about the unity that uh, Dr. Fanon Pazir mentioned several times in his um, talks. And not only that, to extend it to you know, non-Baha'i communities. Um, it, we are in this for a long time. And um, there, is, uh, there is light at the end of the tunnel, but we don't know how long it will take before we get to the end of the tunnel. So I just wanted to um, comment that it is very helpful to, to go, just drop everything and just go after our brothers and sisters. First place Baha'is because we know them inside and out, but and they don't have to be sick or old or away from their family. You can, um, you, you'd be amazed how some families that look very satisfied with their life and everything is going fine, but they are in need just like the rest of us. So just reach out for each other, enrich our own life and help them. And it's our duty. It's not anything like, should I do or shouldn't I do? We must do it. It's our job. And, and not only in this um, difficult time, but at any time, um, just to reach out for each other. And it doesn't have to be buying something, going to visit them. Just a phone call will mean a lot for some people. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. I really want to emphasize that. And, you know, there was one member of a community, my pre, uh, one of my previous communities, and she said, they never call us. They only call us when there's an assembly meeting, a 19-day feast. Nobody calls, has ever called me and said, how are you? How are you doing? You know, without any purpose to it. And that is, that's not just us being kind, it's good for us, it's a prescription for us. You know, what happened in Georgia when that uh, black youth got shot is, is as evil as this virus. I mean, these sort of prejudices which emanate from the lack of um, understanding of the oneness of youth, humanity and the beauty of diversity. You, I believe that whenever we concentrate on our own selves, we become depressed, even when there is no virus around. I'm just talking about my 
myself, you know, when I ever concentrate on my own problems, I, you know, inevitably it gives rise to depression. When we concentrate on others, it helps us. It helps them, it helps us. And we have to be knitted together as we've never been knitted to before. This unity has to be demonstrated to humanity that the cause of Baha'u'llah creates one family. And uh, I think if we just worry about what's happened, you know, in Esfahan, you know, I, by the, I've also recently, a book of mine has come out, a companion to the study of the epistle to the son of the wolf. When two brothers got beheaded in Esfahan, um, the city of my father in Esfahan, the beloved of martyrs and the king of martyrs. And in Esfahan, just last week, they have again increased the persecution of the Baha'is in that city. And, you know, after so many years, you know, um, that's happened. So we have to be concerned with what's happening not only to our own communities around the world, but also trying to rise up to demonstrate the efficacy of the prescription of Baha'u'llah's revelation. But thank you. That was a, so, you know, the faith is a very practical faith. It's, you know, it's good for us. These teachings, these principles are good for us.